Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hello, this is Wayne Callen for Attitude Magazine. Today's topic, Managing Emotionally Intense ADHD Kids and Parents, will be extremely valuable for many of us. We've all been there, those episodes of upset and anger, when our children or teens don't heed our words, or when they act up seemingly out of nowhere. We can all use help on this front. We are very fortunate today to have Elaine Taylor Klaus and Diane Dempster of Impact ADHD, a major resource for parents of children with attention deficit. Professional coaches and educators, Elaine and Diane help parents reduce the stress of raising complex children. They are experts at giving moms and dads the tools to manage themselves and their kids. So, welcome Elaine and Diane. Thank you, and welcome everyone. This is Wayne, first of all, thanks for having us. Sure. And, yeah. uh, and we want to welcome everyone to Calm the Chaos, Strategies for Managing Emotionally Intense Kids and Parents. And today we're going to talk about emotional intensity in ADHD, which is what we like to call it, and strategies for managing it. Generally, when we teach parents how to help their kids learn to manage their ADHD, and that's really our role as parents, is to teach our kids to learn to manage themselves ultimately, a lot of our focus is actually on the parents, not the kids. So we're going to focus in on the adult's role and their relationship to emotionality and impulsivity. Um, and again, this is what we sort of do in all of our programs and in all of the, 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 the information and materials we have on our website. Um, and it's great to do this because you can apply this if you're a parent managing kids with ADHD, but you can also apply it to other relationships that you have with other adults if you don't have kids. Um, so this is really... Or even if you do have kids, actually. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it helps a lot in re managing relationships with others as well as with yourself. And that's really what we're going to focus about today. Yeah, so let's start by talking a little bit about what we mean by emotional intensity. And, you know, that phrase, emotionality, is not always considered a specific criteria for ADHD, but the most of us who've lived with people who have ADHD understand that this really is a challenge for ADHD families generally. It's for the kids who have ADHD, for the adult who has ADHD, and, and even for the adult, if you have an adult in your family who doesn't have ADHD. Often we just, times our I'm kids going to interrupt you one second, Diane. I just want to ask uh, Stuart to change the slide, and we'll try Thanks. to keep up with it. We, we're we're going to be asking Stuart, so y'all bear with us a little. Do it. Okay. Sorry, Diane. Go ahead. There was a little right. impulsive moment. My apologies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So ADHD is a challenge of regulation, and in uh, many ways, it's about self-control, or rather, about a difficulty with changing or controlling behaviors, especially in the face of strong emotions. Um, Self-control does not come naturally to most people with ADHD, so it must be consciously acquired over time. In other words, our kids will not learn self-control automatically. They have to be taught. And for those adults who never learned it as a kid, it can be a huge liability when you're trying to manage ourselves or our relationships as adults. And as I was saying, you know, emotional intensity is a real challenge in families. Our kids can become really emotional um, and our parents' ability to manage our own emotions can have a big influence on, on the situations as well. Yeah, we were just talking about that this morning, actually, about how much this comes up in our work with our parents and the coaching groups. It's sort of a, an issue that parents are constantly dealing with, is when we calm ourselves down and manage ourselves, that's what sets us up for success with managing our kids. Right, because what happens is our, our kids get intense, we get intense, <laughs> and it becomes a hot mess. <laughs> Right. So next slide, Stuart. So ADHD ADHDers are challenged with emotionality, and often they have either a limited tolerance for frustration, and that shows up as a short fuse or emotional outbursts, what we like to call meltdowns, um, or sometimes it shows up as difficult to regulate emotions. That's when people are sensitive, they have intense overreactions, sometimes inappropriate responses to what would otherwise be typical life circumstances. So my son, who's now 13, has been raised in this coaching world for a while now. He explains it really well, I think. He says, you know, Mom, I just feel other people's feelings a whole lot. And when everyone else in the house is nervous or scared or anything, it's like I feel that way too. And that's really what ADHDers face. 
Well, and emotional control is important for both kids and adults. And if you can change the slide here, um, Dr. One. Russell Barkley, whoop, we're on the one with the guy with the briefcase, which is uh, – it you know, looks like one of my old bosses. I shouldn't say that out loud. But um, <laughs> according to Dr. Barkley, uh, who's a re leading researcher on emotionality and ADHD, the ability to have behave appropriately in different life circumstances, which includes your ability to regulate emotions, is a real key life skill for success in adulthood. Relationships rely on our ability to, to manage emotions and communicate feelings effectively. And it's true both in personal relationships, but it also in the professional setting. And it's really kind of interesting because there's some research that they've done to see, you know, what happens to ADDers in the workplace. And ADDers are more likely to lose their job due to emotional outbursts than they are to poor work performance. And, you know, it, what it turns out is that people might forgive you being late or being missing a deadline, but they're less likely to, to forgive uh, or to tolerate outbursts of anger. So we have these two challenge areas in people with ADD, emotionality and impulsivity, and they tend to sort of trigger each other, if you will. It's much like dropping a lit match into a box of fireworks. So if you think about it, disappointment, frustration, anger, and sadness are all difficult emotions for people to learn to manage. So when kids respond impulsively, or adults, when they aren't able to inhibit their action, it's they can actually be more prone to meltdowns, tantrums, or fits, to do or say things that they might regret later. And it's sort of a bit of a vicious cycle. So how do you stop that cycle? Well, the truth is we only have a few minutes to present information for you today, and we want to make sure that you get some solid strategies to take away with you. So we're not going to be able to cover everything that we like to talk about when we, when we address this topic. Um, and we're, but we're going to go into... And we go into a lot of that in more detail in, this, in a webinar we do called Amp It Down to minimize the meltdowns. And we'll give you some information and, and resources to connect with that. So if you want more content on this and more information, we will make that available to all of you. It includes a ton of information in a step-by-step -step way with hundreds of strategies. That's, that's the Minimize Meltdowns program that, that, we, so that we provide for parents to, to address these issues. So we'll give you that information more later. But for now, Diane. So for now, we're going to cover three key things that will help you to amp it down and to minimize the meltdowns. Uh, you know, it's things directly from this program that we offer, and we'll get you started with that. So three things to effectively, more effectively manage emotional intensity in your life. You want to understand it without judgment and accept that it's a natural part of feeling and, and about being ADHD and about feeling and um Two is to manage yourself as best as you can consciously, and three is to prevent when you, po when you possibly can. And we're going to cover a few strategies for each one of these. So the first step is to accept without judgment, and the without judgment is the key piece here. And there are two tips we're going to offer you to teach you how to do that. First is don't take it personally, and the second is get curious. So first, don't take it personally. Other people's anger, frustration, or even their rudeness are usually about them, not about you. So if you can avoid getting triggered and remember that their upset is really not about you, even if they're screaming at you, but it is about their difficulty in managing intense emotions or frustrations, then you can keep your focus where it belongs on not escalating the situation. And Diane, let me just give an example. I was, something happened in my house this morning where my son was upset because he hadn't unloaded his lunchbox. So I, you know, the expectation was he had to then make his own lunch today. And his first reaction to me was almost to scream at me. And instead of taking it personally, I looked at him and I just calmly said, do you have another way to say that? And he sort of stopped and apologized and came back with, it, with a more of a rational tone because he's learned how to handle it. But his initial response was frustration because he was, he was feeling bad about having made a mistake, right? Right. And if we can stay in a place where we don't take it personally and, and avoid the escalation, the second piece of that is to get curious about what's really going on. Yeah. You know, pay attention to what's going on when someone in your family is having trouble, when your kids get emotionally intense, when your spouse gets emotionally intense. Think about what might be going on to create that. And, um, 
and be supportive and, and look at it in a way that you're not blaming them for simple mistakes like spilling things or breaking things. Um, sometimes our kids are really hungry when they tend to met, melt down. Sometimes they're tired. Sometimes it's when they're rushing around the house. And it's important to help our family members to learn how to manage their emotional intensity, but we have to start by helping them to understand what's going on with them when it's happening. And to use that same example from this morning, I, I was clear that he was really not upset with me. He was feeling sort of embarrassed that, and a little stressed uh, at having to add something else to his morning routine. Still, well, and the same curious. Thing. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and I have a client who's got an eight-year-old daughter who has real intense emotional intensity, and they started doing like a journal where they kept a log of when do they, when does she start yelling, when does she lose it, and they realized it was at the end of the day when she was getting really tired or she had, mm -hmm. you know, hadn't yet eaten, and I think that if you can start mapping out and getting getting curious about what's going on rather than jumping in and you know, which we try to do, we try to problem solve, we try to fix, it makes it really difficult. Right. Great. So that's accepting without judgment. And without judgment is key, just keeping a matter-of-fact approach. The second place to focus on learning to manage emotionality and impulsivity, whether for yourself or for a family member, is to focus on your own self-management. And there are two things at play here. First, as we sort of alluded to a little while ago, remaining calm when others are not is a muscle, and it's worth cultivating. It keeps things from escalating. And the second, when you model self-control, then your kids will begin to learn through watching. And this applies to our kids and to our spouses and to other people at our work world. When we maintain that even keel and, mo and model it, other people begin to follow appropriately. So, um, so the goal here, and the next slide would be great, Stuart. The goal here is not to escalate the situation. Emotional intensity is harder to manage calmly. And if we can prevent ourselves from becoming another trigger, from making it worse, from pushing the kid over the edge, right, when we know our kid's already at that limit, if we can pull back instead of pushing over, then we can help them begin to learn, that, learn to manage that intensity more effectively. And that well, starts that really, by focusing on ourselves. Right, and that kind of takes us directly into the third tool, which is prevention. Yeah. And it's important to look not only on prevention efforts to prevent our child from melting down, but, but it can also be prevention of our own triggers, management of our own triggers, and it can be things that we do to prevent, and it can be things that your kids do. So, for example, when you use your own awareness and your understanding to take some actions to reduce the number of upsets or to limit the escalation, like doing a, a, a journal or keeping track of when your child tends to melt down, or staying calm and helping your child to stay to, to keep the escalations from increasing, that's a prevention action that focuses on you. When you talk to your child or your family member about their own challenges and, and help to teach them things like self-management and control, that's taking preventive action that focuses on the other person. And we really need to do both because at the end of the day, again, as we manage ourselves and teach them to manage themselves, we have to, we're, there's a, we're all part of that dynamic. So we can't just focus on our kids. And I think one of the things that we see a lot in parents that come to us who've been trying lots of things and they haven't been working is that they've been focusing a lot on the child at the, without really paying attention to what they're bringing to the dynamic. And, and what we bring as parents really sets the tone and makes a difference. Absolutely. So we have a great memory tip. You can, the next slide would be great, Stuart, for remembering how to prevent emotional meltdowns and limit stress in the home. And we're just going to touch on it briefly here, um, but this is a mnemonic that, that might be able to help you, and this is one of, the, one of the strategies that we use in our Minimize Meltdowns program that we offer in greater detail. So we want to remember to use tact. And that doesn't mean to just be tactful in how we approach things, but it means that we want to identify and anticipate triggers. What are the things, like Diane was saying, is somebody hungry? Are they tired? Are they spent? So identifying triggers and anticipating them. The second step is to avoid those triggers. Uh, one of the things we hear all the time is that rushing tends to be when people get, when meltdowns happen most. Um, when people are late to get out the door, when, when the family starts rushing, that often tends to be what pushes people over an edge. So, and oftentimes if we start rushing, our kids start slowing down, right? Mm -hmm. So we want to avoid the rushing or other kinds of precipitating events. 
so that we recognize the trigger, we avoid it. And the third step is to put consistent systems in place so that we can anticipate what's happening, we can plan for it, the kids know what's happening, um, and it, it really helps them feel on a more even keel. And the fourth step is to plan ahead for transitions. We know when the moments are in our families when things are going to go haywire, right? Diane, were you just yeah. going to say something? Yeah, I was, because I, as you are talking about consistent systems in place, and we are talking about one trigger being food, you know, a great example of this would be to keep snacks in your car. And so if you know you're running late and you're not going to have time to stop and get a snack, you know you've always got power bars or whatever it is in the car so that if your child is particularly hungry because the lunch they served at school or whatever, you know, wasn't appealing to them, you know, you, you've planned ahead and, and it helps you to avoid that rush and avoid that transition challenge. Right. And, and we, we know when the transition times are in our day that we can anticipate. And they start first thing in the morning. Yep. The very first transition that our kids experience is waking up. And so we can plan for how, how do they wake up most effectively and go from that from there throughout the day. So, you know, that's our three steps that we're going to share with you today. Accept without judgment, uh, manage it con consciously, and prevent when possible. And we'd love to go into a lot of details for you. On, on, we have a whole list of stuff on man Meltdown Management 101, but we really don't have time. We want to leave time for all of your questions. So if this is useful to you, and, and I, as I mentioned, we've just scratched the surface. If you want some more information, the best place to go to get started is to look at our a webinar that we've done called Amp It Down. And sometimes that's the best, the best way is to just spend like an hour with this information. Um, we go into a lot of these things in much more detail, and this is a free webinar that you can access. And so just to clarify, Elaine, if, you, if anybody wants to listen to the webinar, it's a free webinar. It, they go to www.ampitdown.com, and um, if you just register, and um, it'll give you instant access to watch the video. Great. So, Wayne, now we can, I know there are lots of questions that have come in, and we would love to spend some time really just talking to people and seeing how we can help. Okay. Well, there are lots, and I'll start with Andrea. She says, I have ADD. ADD, and I'm working hard and am desperate to find strategies that will help me not snap or yell at my two- or three-year-old children. Ooh. Taking a breath strategies don't work for me because I'm way too impulsive. The words are out of my mouth before I remember to breathe. What can I do? Diane, you want to, you want to walk her through the stress cycle? Well, I think that the, the first thing I would say to Andrea is to, you know, is to be gentle with yourself because it's really hard. And, and the reality is that what's going on is something that's very automatic. And when we get triggered, when we come up against something that honestly threatens us, and that's what's happening in that moment when we shout out or lash out at our kids, we're feeling threatened. It's this automatic biological thing that goes on in our body. And, you know, it, it's, it's hormones racing. It's all the blood rushing to our feet. And we literally are going into fight or flight reaction mode. And so I think that the, the most important piece of it, because sometimes it does happen so instantaneously, and, and if you are very impulsive, it can happen so fast that taking that deep breath or trying to take a sip of water or those natural you know, solutions don't always happen. It really becomes about understanding your triggers. And, mm -hmm. and it, when you notice yourself and you know you're going to be in a situation, and, the, and I have a great example, and I'm not ADHD, but I get triggered by my kids' grades. And so I remember very distinctly, I'd go into the online system and I'd look and I'd be like, ah, but I know that that's my trigger. And so I, you know, sometimes I have a glass of wine before I look at the online system. Sometimes I have <laughs> my son look at the online system, but I know that that's a trigger for me. And so that I'm very cautious to step gently when I'm in those situations that I know that are triggers. So and the other thing, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead, and then I'll add one more. <clears throat> the other thing that I would say is to just is, is to begin to create, you know, twenty four seven reminders for yourself. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, I have clients who wear bracelets or who carry um, little uh, stones in their pocket as reminders. But if you know that you've got a short fuse and you know that you're triggered, if you are constantly on the aware, the aware of that, sometimes it can be just enough to say, okay. I've got this bracelet on, and it's going to remind me that I'm trying to stay calm, and I'm trying not to react, and I'm noticing what my triggers are. And so that an increased consciousness can be something that can help as well. That's great. And I don't want to overwhelm Andrea, but I do want to offer one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in, the, in the work that we do, we've created what we call a parenting action model. 
um, and we, we present that to people in the ADHD parent manual. And in that, we cover four critical responses to managing ADHD or to managing any of the complex issue that you're facing, we've come to realize. And one of them is what we call shifting expectations. And so my bet is that part of what's happening, and I see this happening with parents with all age kids, but it happens a lot with toddlers, is that somehow we have an expectation of them that's older than what they're really capable of. So it may be that the other place for you to look is to think about how do you set what are reasonable expectations for a two- or three-year-old child rather than where sometimes we sort of want them to behave more like a four- or five-year-old child and they don't, and then we get frustrated. So the other place I would look would be to set really clear expectations about what, what, how do two- and three-year-olds behave because that's how they're going to behave, and sometimes it can be really annoying. And that shift may help you handle it more effectively. Oh, that's very valuable, I think, to most parents. Yeah. Um, Caroline asks, my eight-year-old son cannot tolerate frustration. Actually, we have a lot of questions about this, um, children not handling frustration well. He suffers from ADHD, and when we ask him to comply, he lashes out verb verbally and physically. Do you have any insight on how to engage his cooperation? Um, it's, it's a, there's a long answer to that. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to see if I can I can hit hit the highlights and Diane check me here. Um, but this is this is a huge issue that that kids with ADHD struggle with is this short frustration tolerance, and um, partly because if they don't do it well the first time they want to give up or you know they they sometimes they're just good at picking up things and so when they don't it's frustrating. Often it happens when they hear the word no and they just don't want to hear the word no. Um, I have a theory that kids with ADD tend to be really tired of being wrong and being redirected all the time because they're constantly being redirected. Even when we don't realize we're doing it, we're redirecting them. And so their fuse becomes really short because they begin to hear everything as a, as a criticism, as a negative, and every request um, or every, every time we say no, they sort of hear it as, as a, they take it personally. So um, part, of, part of the strategies that we offer, and there are a ton of strategies that we use to address this particular issue because it's not a single fix, right? It's, a, it's about shifting your mindset and your approach and beginning to help your child understand reasonable expectations. Um, and we, we cover a lot of that in the Amp It Down webinar um, and in Minimize Meltdowns because it's, it's complicated. Um, but one of the ways that, that I really like to focus on with the kids is, to, is just that simple issue of um, holding the expectation for them that they don't mean to be rude, that they don't mean to be disrespectful, um, knowing that their intention, sort of when we talked a little while ago about getting curious, wh what's going on with them that's got them so frustrated? Are they embarrassed? Are they scared? Are they disappointed in themselves? And if we can understand where they're coming from and, and not take it personally, then we can help redirect them in a way that doesn't feel as critical of them. Diane, what did I miss, or how would you find Yeah, that? no, so I would, I, would, um, I would just kind of highlight that whole thing about disrespect, because I think that that's what ends up happening, is that our, as parents, we see talking back or yelling at us or some of those other things as being disrespectful and, and we mm -hmm. get triggered and we see it as wrong and that it has to stop. And if we could find a way to see it as a natural part of what's going on with them with their ADHD, not that it's okay, but that it's something that's kind of quote unquote beyond their control, that that can be a huge help. The other piece that I think that we end up getting into, um, we, we end up jumping ahead of ourselves. And so if our kids are really triggered and they're upset and they're frustrated we start to jump into to criticizing them for what they're doing rather than helping them to calm down. And I think that, that if we remember mm -hmm. that calming, calming ourselves down or keeping ourselves calm is job number one, and then calming our child down is job number two, because the reality is that if they're triggered and they're upset, it doesn't matter what we say to them. It's not going to make any difference in the world. They're not going to hear us. They're not going to change their behavior unless they're calm and we're calm. And so you have to get into a place where everybody's calm. Then problem solving can happen. But we get ahead of ourselves because we want to fix it. We want it to stop. We want to solve the problem right now.
So, and, you know, so I'm going to offer one strategy for starting that process of calming down. So if you, if you only take one thing from this answer, it's to acknowledge your child's experience. So to really see and recognize what your child is going through and to acknowledge it. I see that you're angry right now. I see that you're frustrated. I bet this is really hard for you. Um, I imagine this, you, might be, you might be really upset by this. Um, but to acknowledge their experience first, it sort of legitimates their experience. And then they, they, sometimes they don't need to react as strongly because they feel a little heard, if that makes sense. Um, we used to use a code word in my house when my kids were little, and my, my older teenager actually just reminded my younger son of this the other day. It was adorable. Um, but it was a code word for, you're not going to like what I have to say, but I have to say it to you anyway. And, um, and so when we used it, they made up the word, it was bubblegum. So whenever we said bubblegum, that was sort of our way of saying to them, take a deep breath and calm down because you, you may not like this, but i got to tell you this. And so sometimes preparing them for what's coming um, gives them a way to learn to begin to manage it more effectively. Okay. Um, Laura is asking about punishment. She asks, what can I do to punish my ADHD child? There are times when punishment is necessary, but I haven't found anything that seems to work. He is very intense, and I don't know how to handle this. That's a tough one. Well, you know, it's funny because my, my instinct is saying that if, there aren't, if you haven't found a punishment that works, that there's some possibility that punishment may not be the best solution to try to change the behavior. Yes. And sometimes it's hard to look at it that way because that intense sort of this has to stop mindset is easy to get into. But sometimes it's about rewarding our child for behaving the way that we want them to and to create a model. And so you start by saying, okay, what's the behavior that I want to change? I want my child to not yell at me when a transition happens. Well, you got to go through all the prevention and figuring out how to prevent the triggers from happening. But if your behavior changes, I want my child to respond without yelling back. You know, then you reward when they do rather than punishing when they don't. And I think that a lot of our kids definitely respond better to the carrot than they do to the stick. And so if you're finding that the punishments aren't working, um, then chances are that, that it may be that you need to start with rewarding the positive rather than punishing the negative. Elaine, would you add anything? Yeah, I would. I mean, what, I, what I'll tell you is that this, this is the kind of work that we do with, with our clients, with our parents all the, all the time, whether it's in our coaching groups or one-to-one -one coaching, because there's a lot of nuance in these. Like, this is it is complicated to raise these complex kids. And it yeah. takes a shift of approach and understanding that doesn't happen in a quick fix. And so, one, I want to say it's, it's not a quick fix. But the other I would say is one of the things we teach parents to look at is to ask the question, is it naughty or is it neurological? And sometimes that's a great structure for you as your child is responding to, to understand it's part of getting curious with what's going on with your child, but is your child's reaction a neurological response because he's being asked to do something that's hard for him or that he's scared by or embarrassed by, or is he really being naughty? Is he looking at you straight in the eyes and pushing that button you just told him not to push? And nine times out of ten, what we find with our kids is that it's neurological, not naughty. Now, sometimes if the behavior has been escalating for a long time and you've been in this power control cycle for a long time, you're going to get more naughty behavior. Um, but what we find when, we, when you look at it in terms of, and we talk about it in terms of consequences, not punishments, um, but natural consequences and, and clearly defined consequences, is to let that system be the, be the enforcer, not the parent so that you get to parent your child, and, and the system or the structure that you put into place is what becomes the enforcer. So, for example, um, if the expectation of your child is that, I don't know, he unloads a dishwasher by 5 o'clock and he hasn't done it, well, then he knows if he, if he hasn't done it, then there won't be access to video games that night. And so you don't have to say, see, I told you, because you get to say, oh, I wish you'd gotten your video games time tonight, summer. I guess hopefully you'll get it tomorrow. You get to be on his team instead of being the enforcer because that power struggle is not the kind of long-term dynamic that's going to work for building a healthy relationship. Lots of parents and adults have asked, 
Are there any nutritional or herbal strategies for children or, or adults who are emotionally intense? <laughs> Love that one. So, you know, I mentioned that we've identified four critical response areas for managing challenges. And the first one that we talk about a lot is what we call activating the brain. And there are lots of different ways that you can activate the brain to help manage and control some of the challenges of ADHD. And I'm a big believer in nutrition. And um, whether it's through healthy eating, nutritional supplementation, um, there are lots and lots of things that, that parents can use. A lot of people talk about the uh, virtues of fish oil and GABA and all sorts of other things. Actually, in, in our Minimized Meltdowns program, we have a handout that we share with parents from the Healthy Foundations program with lots of different supplements and what the benefits are. So um, what I would say is that you know, is there a specific supplement that you can take to improve emotionality? That I can't speak to. I'm not a nutritionist. Um, but I will tell you that I've seen tremendous, tremendous behavioral changes in my family by paying attention to nutrition, paying attention to sleep, water, healthy food. Um, uh, sometimes food, you know, sensitivities can cause serious emotional upsets in my family. My family is gluten intolerant. And it causes a lot of emotional intensity. And so as long as they're not on gluten, they are able to manage their emotions much better. Now, that's not for every family. But if you can find the, um, the, the things that cause stressors and supplement with healthy choices and healthy eating and, and sometimes healthy supplementation, you can really teach kids and help kids learn to manage themselves. Well, I, you know, it, it's funny because this isn't a supplement, but the thing that kind of comes to me as we're talking is is the role of, of meditation and, and mindfulness. And mm -hmm. there's been a lot of research that showed that if you can if you can help your child in the calm moments to notice that they're calm and pay attention to the breath and some of the things that I, I, I'm a meditator and, and a lot of and a lot of folks are as well, you know, teaching some of those basic tools of awareness to kids even at young ages can help both prevent it, but then also in that we were talking about the fact that job number one is, is getting calm again before you can start to problem solve. It can help shorten that time frame of, of escalation so that they can get calmer faster. And we do, we've done a webinar called, about the seven ways to activate the brain. Um, there's a lot of material about it on our, on our website because we're really big believers that, that the brain is a big part of what's happening with ADHD, and we have to be conscious about optimizing um, our brain function, and we're trying to help kids manage. Well, sort of in that same vein, we have questions about medication tweaks. Can using medication effectively perhaps limit the emotional intensity? That, that is a tough question. <laughs> I, I, that I, I have to say, first what I will say is that we're not physicians, we're not psychologists, we're coaches. Um, we have a lot of experience from our own children and from the clients that we work with, but we're not, we're not qualified to make statements about what you should or shouldn't or might want to do or to use medication for managing. Um, having said that, Diane, was there something, it sounds like you had a thought you wanted to share. Nope, I was going to kind of start with that same sort of thing. So I, you, you've got more experience with emotionally intense kids than I do. What have you? Are you saying something about my kids? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> Um, so here's what I will say, um, is that, you know, again, I'm a big believer in supplementation in addition to medication, and I, and I think that they all play their role. There was, there was a point in my family's life where I treated my daughter's anxiety with intense doses of fish oil for several years. And, and Wayne, I saw you've got Kelly Dorfman on in, coming up in a, in a week or two, right? Yes, yes. So Kelly Dorfman is the person to, to ask some of these questions of. She's amazing. She saved my child's life. And I'm a huge, huge fan of hers. And um, there are a lot of nutritional ways that you can help kids learn to manage emotionality. Um, and you just want to do it in, with, in the context of the other choices and challenges that you're addressing and the other strategies you're using. And you want to make sure that you've got somebody you trust who's working with you on it. For me, for many years, it was Kelly. For it, maybe your physician, pediatrician, psychiatrist, whomever it is. But... But make sure you've got somebody who understands the chemical nature of the brain to help you with that kind of, of, of way of addressing it. But, mm -hmm. but it can be very effective, and it can really, really make a difference. It's just a little more complicated. Yes. Okay. 
A fair number of questions about meltdowns at school, not at home. Uh, my son is in second grade, and this is from Katie, and is very emotionally charged. His teacher loses touch with his diagnosis and takes his inability to focus out on him. This has only made his anger, sadness, and anxiety more intense, creating a wedge between him and learning. Ooh. How can I focus the teacher's thoughts on the fact that my son has a disorder? Yeah, it's it's hard because, you know, our kids go off to school in the morning and, and you know, even when we get to the point where we can see that our kids' challenges are because of their neurological disorder or their, their ADHD, it's um, not everybody out in the world sees it that way. And so, you know, the best thing we can do as parents is to advocate like crazy and to find a way to have conversations with those teachers to explain, to, to talk about what works at home. I think that that's one of the things that I do a lot is I don't try to focus on what's going on there, but I say, you know, I don't know if you're having problems with this at school, but I'm having problems with this at home and this is what's working for me at home. If you are having problems, it might be something that you might want to do. I think the other piece of it is to find ways to uh, really partner with a teacher because a lot of times when our kids are threatened, which sounds like in this, this situation, it's not, it, you know, it's, it's painful for the parent to watch, um, you know, going in as, as partner in a partnership with a teacher rather than as a, you can't do this to my child is an important yeah. thing that I would, I would highlight because it's really easy to go in there and say, you can't do this, but I, it doesn't always doesn't always the most helpful way to kind of go in and approach a teacher. Right. Lane, what would you add? I mean, this is it's a really hard hard, hard issue. One of the things um, you know, we've written a bunch on communicating with your child's teacher on our website. Um, you know, earlier in our in our tips earlier, we talked about I mentioned the idea of acknowledging our kids, and one of the things I taught a teacher to do once who was having a hard time, it's like she, she got that he was ADD, but I don't think she really understood it. And when I taught her just to acknowledge for him what he was doing well before she started pointing out what else he needed to do or hadn't done, just that little bit made such a difference for him. Because he just needed to hear the good stuff before she dove into the bad stuff. So sometimes it's just little tweaks of training and conversations with the teachers step by step. Um, and we do, again, we, we work with parents a lot on this. We do this a lot in our, in our coaches' groups um, because this is, it's a common issue for parents. We, we understand it, or as we begin to understand it more, we forget or it's hard to accept that our teachers actually often don't know it and understand it as well as we do. So we have to advocate, we have to educate, and we have to do it with a great deal of diplomacy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the only way I can say it. Yes. I've got a, one, one um, coach, a colleague who says she goes to school every year with a box of donuts and a thing of coffee and does the rounds. Yeah. <laughs> that always helps. Yeah. Yes. Being really grateful for what the teacher is doing and acknowledging the teacher in the conversation for what they're doing yes. well before you redirect is another biggie. Um, Beth has a question. This is about a spouse and a preteen. I am having difficulty dealing with explosive emotions from my preteen and my ADHD husband. They egg each other on and it makes the household more heated than necessary. It has become intolerable. How do I deal with my spouse and my preteen? <laughs> Minimize meltdowns. <laughs> yeah. Diane, what would you say? Because that's a there's a lot of dynamics going on there. Yeah, you know, I think that that's the piece of it is that part of it is about um, you know, managing the situation for yourself and figuring out, you know, what do you need in that moment? So it's kind of like, you know, our tendency is to kind of want them to stop, but there may be some value that they're getting from, from the intensity of, of what's going on. And so sometimes it's about just kind of stepping out of it and letting them do what they need to do. But I think the other piece of it is um, setting some ground rules about what is and isn't okay. And I think that and um, one of the things we talk a lot about is having a house rules. And with a teenager and a spouse and everything else, it's kind of like, you know, when we get angry, what's okay and what's not okay? And having everybody have to play by those same rules. And so that when you get in that situation and you say things that, you know, we, we've all said things that we wish we hadn't said. But it, it's about kind of laying the groundwork and setting the agreement in a calm situation where, um, you know, how do we want to behave with each other and how do we call each other on it when we're not? And it's hard because in those instances, and it's really intense, sometimes what you got to do is step out. Elaine, what yeah. would you add? 
Well, Beth, that it's, I mean, it, it's a hard dynamic because um, really the, the place to focus here is on your spouse. And, um, and that can be, that in and of itself can be a very difficult dynamic because, you know, if you go in there blaming, then he's going to get defensive and that's going to escalate another trigger. And um, so the, the question, I, the place I think I would focus, and again, this is, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there is a lot of information. Actually, I say it in jest, but there's a great deal of information about this in the Minimizing Outcomes Program. So I would really recommend that you look at the Amp It Down webinar. Um, because my, one of my assistants, as we were creating it, called me up, and she was so excited. She said, it worked with my husband. It worked. It worked. <laughs> um, but so I think the place to focus is, is with him and, to, and have a private conversation with him away from your son about where can you be aligned about what you want in terms of the tone of the home, what you're trying to create in your home. Um, and if you can, with your spouse, create sort of a shared vision of what you want the home to be like so that you become, you're approaching it from a supportive place with him about, okay, how do I help you not get triggered? How do I help you um, create this? How can we do this together? Um, I would start with that place of what we call alignment, finding where do you and your husband share a vision of what you're trying, what you want for your family, and start there instead of trying to start with, um, we don't want to scream at our kids, because that gets, you know, that gets a trigger place. I hope that helps. That's a tough one. Yeah. But I definitely think Ampadam will help you with that a lot. I recommend that a lot. Uh, Nancy asks, um, <laughs> if the ADHD child constantly is annoyed by siblings, how much control should the ADHD child have in controlling his siblings, what his siblings do and don't do? I, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm curious if she could respond to this, but I'm, I, I'm curious as to whether the child is older or younger. Um, but the short version would be that, um, that you want to sort of go for what's, what feels fair and comfortable for everyone. And, you know, long term, we're, what we're looking for is for our siblings to have relationships with each other to be, um, to be uh, connected with each other. So we want to foster good, healthy sibling relationships. And if you begin to create a dynamic where one sibling is cutting off the others and has that kind of control, you're going to start breeding resentment with the other siblings. So there has to be a balance about what's fair for everybody. And that may mean sometimes, sometimes sort of going in the direction of what the ADHD child needs and sometimes going in the direction of the other children. But you want your kids to have a sense that you're looking at what's best for everybody and all of them and not just constantly only supporting the one child over the others. Diane, what would you add? Well, I think it's, it's again, it's an opportunity to um, educate the family about what's going on with ADHD. And you certainly don't want to, you know, go overboard and, and, you know, focus on the ADD kid over the other family members, but particularly if the kids are older, it's important that they understand and, and can learn some of the same tools we talked about today about having compassion and, and understanding that it's not, that they, sometimes they aren't doing it on purpose um, and that you're going to do what you can to keep things okay for them, but we also have to have um, some understanding and some and, and of, of the situation from this, from the other child's perspective. Right, and that, that, it's a good conversation to have at a family meeting if you do those, um, to sort of let the family talk about what works, what doesn't, how, you know, how does it feel when that happens for me, so that you might be able to set some, some group expectations around, you know, when is it okay for this child to do this, and when is it a point where, you know, maybe they need to go to another room, or maybe the kid being annoyed needs to go to another room. And it's, it's a dance that you're constantly... Um, you're constantly in a dance with your kids when you're in that kind of a dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, so you just want to be conscious that you're in it and, and keep that fairness mentality. Kids are big about fairness. So just making sure they know that you're conscious that you're being fair, that your intention is to be fair will go a long way. A fair number of questions about teens. Um, <laughs> Jules asks, sometimes it is hard to tell the difference between ADHD, defiance, impulsivity, and emotions, and typical teen behavior. Indifference being difficult, thinking they know everything. 
Mm -hmm. uh, she's just questioning when she should discipline something and when she should let something pass as typical teen behavior. What I tend to work with my clients on is, you know, kind of it's this back to this naughty versus neurological piece of it. And it's kind of like if I start with the idea that 100 percent of this is naughty and they're just being a defiant teenager, how would I handle this situation? And if it was 100 percent that I knew that it was just their ADHD, how would I handle this situation? And kind of look at those two extremes. And, and sometimes we've got to try them. I mean, part of what it is to be an ADHD, a parent of a kid with ADHD is you've got to experiment. You've got to try different things. You've got to try the carrot. You've got to try the stick got to try and, and be inventive and creative because the same thing's not going to work all the time. Um, and so it, it's about kind of looking at both of those extremes and then trying to figure out what feels, I, I, this is going to sound kind of corny, but it's kind of like what feels best to you. You know, what is it that, that you think is a reasonable activity, that uh, action to take in terms of addressing it? Elaine, how would you add? Yeah, no, totally right on with that. And, and then the other thing I would add to it is that, um, you know, it helps for us with teenagers, and I'm a big fan. I just want to say I have now three teenagers, so I'm a big fan of teenagers because um, I think they're interesting, and um, they are becoming their own people, and they have their own mind, and I want that for them, but that does make it harder to parent them So because they're becoming more individual. So I think the place that I like to focus on with them and, and as well with my clients is to get really clear on what's important and what's not. You know, we cannot take up every battle and every issue. So with teenagers, we want to get really clear on what are the values that are most important to us right now. So, for example, if we do, if, we're, if I'm working with a client, um, and I see this happening a lot with, with moms of teenage boys in particular, where that value that you have around order and structure is getting stepped on every day by the kid leaving the, you know, the wet towel on the floor and throwing the backpack all over the place. And, and we just want to remember that we also have a value around having a relationship with our son or our daughter and, um, and that you know, we want a loving family dynamic. And so sometimes we're going to talk about that towel on the floor and sometimes we just need to let it go because we really want to talk about how was your day or what happened in school and not let everything be a battle and, a con and an issue of, of a control game because they will push, push, push to, to make everything about control if we let them. And if we don't take up the mantle, um, they're going to they're gonna pull back more. Um, so yes to naughty and neurological, as Diane is saying, absolutely. And there's also something about teenagers that's about really, it's about learning to let go because we're going to have to let them begin to make their own choices and make their own mistakes more and more. And their life isn't going to look like what we thought we wanted them to look like when they got it to that age. It's going to look like what they want to create. And we want to give them as many tools as possible to do that well. But once they start to become teenagers, we have to start pulling back and letting them figure it out. And it's a hard, hard thing to do. When does emotional, I should say, how do you distinguish between emotional intensity and ODD? That's a hard question to answer. Um, you guys are good. That one's really tough. I, that, ODD is technically a clinical diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that is not something that, that I would say we necessarily have an expertise in. I did see a presentation at a, at a coaching conference once um, where uh, there was a conversation that was actually based on the research of Russell Barkley, who was really challenging um, whether ODD exists independently or whether it's sort of that emotionality subset of ADHD. So I think that there's a point where if you're involved with your practitioners and you're addressing um, the medical aspects of, of your diagnoses to the extent possible, but if you're doing that well, there's a point where it almost doesn't matter whether it's ADD or ADD. What matters is how are you handling it? And do you feel calm and confident in how you're handling it as a parent? Because at the end of the day, your calm and confidence is what's going to set the tone and help you teach your kids to manage themselves. It's going to help you set reasonable, calm, clear expectations and hold accountability to them. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of our parents that we work with, a ton of them have kids who also have diagnoses of, of ODD. 
Um, as I imagine, if we have a program called Minimize Meltdowns, we get a lot of ODD parents. Um, and, and what we find is that sometimes there is just this sort of opposition that's, that's definitely neurological. But sometimes you've got a kid who has just gotten so frustrated and so catabolic and angry in learning, in, in sort of running into the world, that their automatic response is this sort of anger reaction. And if we can begin to help them learn to feel more calm and in control, then we begin to see that reaction, reactivity change. Diane, does that make sense? It, it does, and whenever you know, whenever I get a question like this from a client, you know, the the question back is why? What is it about knowing what it is, whether it's ODD or ADD, that's important? And mm -hmm. and because uh, a lot of times we get hung up on, well, if I just had a diagnosis or if I just understood why it's like this, and I you know, and I and I would encourage parents to kind of let go of that, you know, yeah. because you've got a child who's standing in front of you who needs support, regardless of what the label is. Be curious. Be supportive. Do you know? Do what you can as a parent, and and focus less on the why and focus more on the on the what you can do about it. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, we have kids who are in pain, you know, and we don't see it as pain. We see it as as rude and obstinate and disrespectful. But ultimately, I truly believe that kids want to be. Um, well, you know, well enough behave, they want to be compliant, they want to be successful, and it's got to be unbelievably frustrating for them not to be able to be and to, to feel like all the adults in their world see them as, as, as kids who are messing up all the time. So, you know, when we can come from a place of compassion for what their experience is, that really gives us a great opportunity to help them instead of getting mad at them. What about when emotional intensity turns into physical expression, whether it be throwing things, putting a fist through a wall, threatening a mother or a spouse, threatening his wife? What, how, how do you begin to manage that? Well, I mean, I think that it, it's always important that we are doing what we can to keep everyone safe, and, and a lot of times intensity gets pretty intense. Um, but I think that that what is most what what it keeps coming back to me is that you know it's about staying as calm as you can, avoiding yourself getting triggered, uh, getting to a safe place if you need to, you know, stepping mm -hmm. out of the room, stepping out of the situation if you need to, but stay as calm as you can, and then focus as much as you can on helping the child to calm down. Because I think that that's the thing. It's like we get into we when that happens, we get into a lecture about why our kids shouldn't hit us and how bad it is and how disrespectful they are. And and it's kind of like a, the 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 peanuts care, you know, the, the teacher and the peanuts is like blah 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 blah. Our kids don't hear us. And so we've got to get right. them to a place where they're calm, where they can see that their emotional intensity is is re, you know, they feel like it's real. They, it's they acknowledge, it's to validate what they're going through and then help them to calm down before you jump in and try to say, this can't happen, and, you know, this is terrible, and, and it is, and, and you want us to keep people safe, but at the same time, you know, know that this is a very real and very automatic response and not something that our kids really are doing purposefully. Generally. And, and then the other thing I would say is that Generally. If, if, if you're dealing with, um, if anybody's feeling physically threatened, then you need to go, you need to escalate to that next level of support. You need to get therapy. You need to get coaching. You need to get support to, to figure out how to get, help the family get out of that environment quickly because, um, because violence is going to breed violence. And, um, and I, I, would, or I have not, not yet come across a client who's brought these kinds of examples to us, and we definitely see parents who are dealing with this all the time, where the kid has really intentionally been putting a hand through the wall. The kid is putting the hand through the wall because he's so frustrated he doesn't know what else to do. So <clears throat> we want to really focus on how do we help the kid learn to manage the frustration and take aim there instead of taking aim on the fact that he put the hole in the wall. Now, he still has to be accountable for the hole in the wall. We can, we can come back to that. But if we if we focus in on where the real challenge is showing up for him and help him manage it, 
that will mitigate a lot of the behaviors. And if it's not, then you, you absolutely need to be working with a therapist to help you manage. Okay. Well, the hour has come to an end. We will have to end it there. Thank you very much, Elaine and Diane, for such an informative webinar. There were plenty of takeaways for all of us parents. Um, thanks for having us, Wayne. It was an absolute yeah, pleasure. Thanks so much. Have a good day, everyone. For more Attitude podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. <laughs>